As Jody said, my name is Loyal Waldridge, and I'm the chairperson of the regional district of the Central Okanagan, and the Emergency Operations Centre is a function of our organization. I'd like to acknowledge Emily Letnick, who's joining us today, as well as Mayors Dias, Ireland Milsom, and Chief Louis. Um, all, of, all of the elected officials are available for comment following the press conference today. This will be our first, fourth press conference regarding the wildfires here in the central Okanagan. I'm pleased to say that yesterday was another good day and we continue to see progress made on these wildfires and our response that the challenges have brought. The EOC has issued no new evacuation orders and downgraded an order to an alert. Our team was able to identify a temporary solution for garbage and recycling and have resumed curbside collection this morning for residents outside of alert and order areas. Today, you'll hear from BC Wildfire Service, the local fire chiefs, emergency support services, and our public information officer. They will share more information about progress on the front lines, an update on assessments for structural loss, supports for evacuees, and what we can expect over the next 24 hours. While we acknowledge that progress has been made over the last two days, it's important to also recognize the anxiety and grief that everyone collectively is facing over these past few days and months ahead. Over the past 24 hours, we've heard from evacuees who have been waiting to register with emergency support services. We understand that the queue has been long and we have been working on solutions. Please be patient with support staff. I'd like to extend my gratitude to the collective voice of the mayors around this table, as well as our MLAs, who have been working tirelessly to increase resources in our ESS reception centers. The province has heard our call, and you'll hear more about that um, from our ESS coordinator. As of this morning, we've had 9,855 properties on evacuation order. These are unprecedented numbers. ESS coordinator Jason Bedell is here today to provide you an update on the steps that we've taken to support evacuees. Before I hand it over to our subject matter experts, I want to make a brief comment about our next steps. We've begun what is known as structure loss reporting and are looking ahead to return, to return home and recovery efforts. We know everyone is eager to get home and get answers on your properties. This is a priority for us as well. I was informed by our de deputy director that an advanced planning team has been formed and they will be working to support the efforts, that, but it will take time. Please know that we are in great hands. To close today, I want to emphasize, emphasize that we still have a long road ahead of us. We need everyone to continue to stay up to date on the status of alerts and orders as conditions change at cordemergency.ca. Stay out of evacuated areas until advised otherwise and continue to support one another. While we know that there's going to be challenging days ahead, we cannot forget that we will get through this. United as a region, we will recover, rebuild, and restore. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Wilbridge. And if I could ask now, please, Jared Schroeder from the Sea Wildfire Service to come tonight. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Thanks for having me again. I appreciate the time here in this space to connect with all of you and share our progress on uh, the gross complex of wildfires here in the central Okanagan. Um, <clears throat> I'll start off by saying that the fires within our complex remain out of control. Um, while I say that, I also want to share that we continue to make very excellent progress over this last 24-hour period, including last night's overnight period, in our primary objectives that revolve around providing that direct response to structure protection and the protection of critical infrastructure here on all of these fires within the central Okanagan on the Grouse Complex. Um, so when we're saying that they're out of control, um, that still means that they're not held. We're continuing to take those steps within all of our, these communities, within all the sections of fire line, within these priority areas, to get these fires to a state of held and to begin the process, as was just shared, to be able to rescind orders to alerts and to continue on with getting folks and people back into their homes and restoring the, the regular process of business and, um, of, and livelihood and life of those affected by, by these wildfires. In the coming days, uh, in this tonight's overnight period and throughout the day today, we're going to continue to see this heavy smoke lingering in the valley. 
Um, hopefully it will lift this afternoon. We expect it to lift a little bit, um, but that does impact our ability to provide um, that overhead kind of bird's eye view assessment. Uh, it does impact our ability to accurately map at a point source, finely detailed um, a, a grid and perimeter of our, these fires within our complex. Um, we are making efforts to do that um, in other ways as well. And I would like to be able to provide you a better, more accurate size update at this time, in particular for the McDougall fire. Um, that is coming. It remains at 11,000 as an estimate, uh, which I do believe is close, but the fire will likely, uh, once we do have the ability to map it out more accurately, the number will be larger. Looking at the weather here in the next couple of days, uh, we are expecting to continue to see these more seasonal temperatures in the mid-20s. The humidities will be working as well in our favor. It's been kind of the discussion point the last couple of days. Um, that'll continue today. Uh, we're going to be seeing some winds shift more so to that southerly as the day progresses and into tomorrow. It'll be in a fashion that we're not expecting any rapid increases in fire behavior or spread on any of these fires. Um, so for today, while we are still working under the context of extreme drought conditions and our fire weather values are in the extreme levels, um, Today, again, for fire behavior, we're, we're not expecting any significant explosive growth or anything like that. Um, it is effectively another good day to fight fire, with the exception of uh, our visibility being impeded by the smoke uh, locally here in the valley. I want to take a moment to address that also specifically in that um, our air carriers, you know, the pilots and the engineers that service these machines, uh, our air tanker pilots and the air tanker program in general, we make every effort to get those assets out to support our on the ground work, to support the work being done by our structure protection and, and fire departments. Um, and this is something that is continually assessed throughout the day, not just from an incident management and an air operations perspective, but also from our firefighters on the ground who are looking for that support, who see opportunities to bring in these assets. Um, it, it's something that is happening almost by the minute. Every firefighter is considering this. Our overhead supervisors, our helicopter coordinators, the incident commanders themselves are considering these assets. We continually monitor visibility in order to bring these tools in to further support and bolster our efforts on the ground. And we do do so and will do so as those opportunities arise. Um, Unfortunately, we are limited by the terrain, the topography, and the, the localized smoke in the valley to do so. But we do take that advantage as it arises, um, and it happens continually. Um, going forward, uh, our, as I mentioned, our, our focus does, our number one priority for these incidents does remain on that direct response to structure protection and critical infrastructure. But that also means um, our other primaries do, uh, primary objectives do include continuing to build out our structure to support ourselves um, from a management perspective and from a firefighting perspective as we look forward to moving out of the interface and into the more wildland environment. And that includes advanced planning, that includes our technical specialists who are looking at and engaging with the environment, with old fire burns, old scars, terrain, topography, connecting with local nations and local governments in a can, building out a plan for what the next steps of fire management on, on this complex looks like. That includes management of the north side of the fire, the west side of the fire, and building out plans, control lines. Uh, we have line locators already engaged with heavy equipment, beginning that piece of what the next phase of our response is going to look like here in, into the next week, into the, the, the next couple days, and into the future as well. Um, it's a long haul. This is a priority that is uh, effectively right below, but not necessarily less than the primary objective of providing that structure protection and critical infrastructure support. But it's important that we start this process, and this is ongoing, and it is bolstered by our technical specialists, by our forecasters, and all the other folks who support us in, in meeting these objectives. So please know that this is work ongoing. Um, it's been shared enough, I think, at this point, uh, where we're at in regards to our priorities, but this is something um, that is going to be continued into the future into the more strategic plan for our response um, as we move out of the interface in the coming weeks uh, for, for this complex. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Schroeder. Um, next, could we please have Carrie O'Rourke, uh, Public Information Officer for the Emergency Operations Center. Hello. I wanted to reassure that we are working to get everyone home as soon as possible and when it's safe to do so. 
but there are many steps which need to be taken in, in order for that to happen. We know everyone who is on evacuation order is looking for information about the status of their properties and the plans for the evacuation orders. As we shared yesterday, the Canada Task Force One team is going through the affected neighbourhoods in a, a very systematic way, mapping structural losses. And our EOC operations will, con will be conducting uh, hazard assessments to help us understand what needs to be done to ensure the safety of the area. Some of these hazards include downed power lines, unstable structures, dangerous trees, equipment and debris in the area, and hazardous materials. The mapping and assessments are actively <coughs> underway and nearing completion in some areas. Today, the Canada Task Force One is working on the west side. The team is hoping to get as far as Pine Point and hoping to complete the west side road within the electoral area west over the next few days. The EOC teams are already working diligently to go into these areas to identify these hazards and work towards mitigation, which is a critical step in the pr process of returning people to their communities safely. We will systematically start the, to release information as soon as we can. Our priority is to confirm how we can get this information to our communities as quickly and as accurately as possible. We know this is a very challenging time for everyone in our community. Our chiefs will now share the most current information that they have about the status of the fire in each community. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to speak specifically to City of West Kelowna and WFN, so I just want to temper my comments with that. What I say may be different in another jurisdiction. So uh, yesterday we had a good day, and last night we had a, a good night. Uh, I can confirm that in the last 24 hours we have lost no new structures uh, in the City of West Kelowna uh, or WFN territory. The hard work is being done right now. Uh, Rain is in the forecast, and I'm optimistic about that. But what's happening out there is the day-to-day -day grind of firefighting. Uh, I've got a lot to share today, so I'm going to just get right to it. I'm going to first of all share some stories about the incredible work of firefighters and some of the things that are happening out there on the front lines. When I ask... 10,000 of you to leave your homes. I feel like I owe it to you in order to tell you these stories and give you as much information as I possibly can. And that's what I'm going to do today. So uh, first of all, there's been some real moments in this for all of us and for me in particular. And today was another one. Uh, every morning we have what we've dubbed the morning fire truck parade. And that takes place right outside my office at the main uh, fire hall in West Kelowna. And that's when we witness, you know, almost 50 fire apparatus from, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of fire departments from around the province um, arrive, get their breakfast and head out uh, to do the hard work of the day. And it is an incredible sight. I was there this morning. I saw the firefighters from the night shift coming back and they were black. And they were black because they were out there doing that grind, that hard work of firefighting um, all through the night. I had, a, I had one that gave me goosebumps and I don't have all the details. Uh, I don't expect to have them, but I will share what I do have with you. I came to learn this morning that one of the crews uh, working uh, on this fire, uh, one of the structural firefighting uh, one of the structural firefighters, today was scheduled to become a Canadian citizen. And of course, he wasn't able to attend the ceremony. And what an important thing and what a massive sacrifice to make. But he's going to do it, and he's going to do it by Zoom from behind the front lines. And people are asking Mary, me where he's from, and I don't know. But what I do know is he's going to be from Canada, and that is just gives me goosebumps to tell that story. I want to talk about the firefighters of West Kelowna Fire Rescue for a moment. 
Our firefighters are pulling back-to-back -back shifts. I visited the fire hall for coffee uh, briefly this morning with my crews, and I sat around the table and looked at them. And then I went over to the other fire hall for the morning fire truck parade, as we've dubbed it. And I saw the same guys. They had worked the night shift at the fire hall, and we had half a dozen calls last night. And then they came out, got on the truck, and went to the front lines. And they were probably hoping they wouldn't bump into me because I'd be telling them, you need to get some rest. But they wouldn't listen to me. And if they were telling me that, I wouldn't do it either. That's why we're all here. Our paid on call firefighters are often, especially now it's the work week, working out in the field, coming in and then going to their regular jobs or running their businesses at the same time. And this is all in addition to the day-to-day -day business of our fire department, the medical responses, the motor vehicle accidents, the, the fires in other places in our community, uh, of which um, these are continuing to go on. So I've, I've been told a couple things about leadership, and they've proven themselves here for me. As a leader, it's my job to keep the most important thing the most important thing, and that's what we're all working towards. But I think the secret of being a good leader is surrounding yourself with really good people. So I've talked a lot about the firefighters, but I've had the privilege of sitting up here and, and being the face of this for our community. But really, I wouldn't be in the position I'm in if it wasn't for the four people standing behind me. Deputy Chief, Gartrell, Deputy Chief Watson, Assistant Chief Bateman, and Assistant Chief Breeden. These four men make me uh, the person that I am. And I would really uh, look clueless if it wasn't for their support. So I want to highlight those people who are all standing up right behind me. Um, our biggest challenge in the last 24 hours has been air quality. Uh, it is choking. We all know that because we've came here today and spent a short period of time in it. But the firefighters are outside working in it relentlessly. They're breathing it for 12, 14, 16 hours at a time. So it is a real challenge. Someone told me today that our air quality here is the worst in the world um, at present. So I said the quality of a good leader is to keep the most important thing the most important thing. And what is our most important thing today? That is, I know people want to know information and I know they want to go home. We are going to take a systematic approach to both of those. We're going to do it right. We're going to make sure that to the best of our ability, we don't make mistakes. We don't tell someone something that isn't true. We don't send you into a place that's not safe for you to be. In going through these neighborhoods, we're finding, for example, that the addresses just aren't on the buildings. The, some cases, the buildings are gone. In some cases, the street signs are melted. So even correlating street names to maps uh, is a challenge for the people on the ground. I said we're going to do it when it's safe. In some cases, the roads may not be passable. We can fix the hydro, we can remove the burned power poles, and that work's being done by BC Hydro. But in some cases, the roads are damaged, and we need to resolve that first. In many cases right now, your neighborhoods and houses are covered with sprinklers, and those sprinklers are protecting your home. But it means we can't send you home because the streets have fire hoses, fire pumps, water bladders um, scattered throughout the area. Uh, many, are you gonna, are, many of you will come home and find your yards in disarray. And it's because firefighters have gone through and done the fire smart work at the last minute. They've moved your patio furniture. I drove down my street and six of my neighbors in a row had straw mats at their front door. The firefighters tossed them all out in the street. That's the kind of work that's being done out there to protect your homes. I want to give another example from uh, the Upper Bear Creek Road neighborhood. Uh, our crews finally penetrated into that neighborhood yesterday. And what they found 
was that a hurricane had passed through. Trees were ripped out by their roots. And the force that it takes to do that is incredible. And this is what we're seeing in the neighborhoods. So I, I, want, to, I want to share some news that's going to cause many of you great relief, but I also acknowledge that it's gonna cause many of you some ongoing and increased anguish. But I think it's important to get it out and to get it out as we know it. Because of the hard work of Canada Task Force One, I'm able to share this with you, specific to the city of West Kelowna and West Bank First Nation. The following neighborhoods have no structural losses. Smith Creek, Tallis Ridge, Shannon Lake, the Lens Road Trailer Park, and Rose Valley. These neighborhoods, we have suffered no loss of structures. Other neighborhoods are still under assessment. I can report today that I have a loss estimate for the neighborhoods that we have visited. This number is an estimate and it represents full and partial losses within the neighborhoods. We estimate that there's approximately 50 structures. Now I wanna temper that by saying we're not done yet and the most damaged neighborhoods are still to come. However, I think it's important that people begin to understand the scope and scale of what our community is facing. So with that said, I have a few asks of the public. I wanna thank you all for everything you're doing for us. I know many of you feel helpless and that there's nothing that you can do. I know many of you feel like the way you can help us is by bringing us something. And in the early days of this incident, we have been so appreciative of the water and Gatorade and food and fruit and vegetables and you name it, you have brought it to us. But quite frankly, folks, it's becoming overwhelming and it's becoming unsafe. Um, I, I would... I can't wait for a day when I can have a home cooked meal, but please don't bring it to the fire hall because I can't serve it to the firefighters safely. So what I'm asking for is instead of your donations of food and water and all of, all of that, I'm asking you to write a card or put a post on social media. Thank the firefighters that are out there kicking ass. Make them know that you understand what they're doing and put it out there. Continue to bring your kids by the fire hall. And Chief Lee said it eloquently yesterday. Teach them about what it means to be a public servant. Let's inspire the next generation um, through the, the public service that's happening out there today. So my ask uh, again is as it has been for the last several days, I ask for your patience. I hope I've demonstrated you to, to you today that we are making progress. I ask for your calmness. I ask for your cooperation with us. And most of all, I ask in whatever you're doing out there, do it safely. These are the things that we're doing in the field. And these are the things that I'm asking the public to do as well. So thank you. Thank you, Chief Roland. Uh, if I could please invite Travis Whiting, Kelowna Fire Chief. Uh, good morning and thank you and uh, you know Chief Brolin thank you for that uh, a lot of great uh, stories and information there and um, you know to an extent a lot of that's mirrored on our side as we see uh, out at UBC uh, Okanagan uh, the mass amount of uh, apparatus and iron that's sitting there uh, from across the province and that same parade in and out we were on the chiefly uh, addressed the crew the, the crowd this morning and had the opportunity to yesterday and the deep appreciation for those coming in and I also wanted to this morning, just uh, as, as he had noted, our crews uh, for the citizens of Kelowna, uh, Kelowna Fire Department members are back in hall, back in station, running our regular shift and protecting the community as they do on a regular basis. Um, and again, also grabbing double duty so that they can be on the front lines of hardening uh, 
uh, the fire that we have right now and ensuring that we uh, we maintain that perimeter that we've established to this point. So it's long days and I just want to pass on my deep appreciation to my crews uh, that are out there today uh, protecting this community, but also the crews that are doing those extra shifts and working in uh, working on uh, cold trailing and trying to perimeter this fire to uh, to establish a good guard so that we can ensure we have no further structural loss. So uh, as far as the fire itself, I'll give a quick update. Um, as uh, consistent with uh, the other side of the lake, we had really subdued uh, fire activity last night. Things looked good, uh, really happy with the progress that was made. Uh, reports came in uh, uh, from my leads uh, that things were very good overnight. Um, same as yesterday, we are hitting hard around the perimeter, working uh, diligently to go step by step to uh, ensure that the perimeter of this fire is cool and cold and not able to spread beyond where it is. Um, that being said, we do have active flame in some neighbourhoods um, that we are managing. It's not a high risk, but I say that only for the purpose of people understanding that we won't be having people go home in the next day or so for sure uh, that are out right now. We don't anticipate any changes to alerts or orders. We're still actively working in all of those neighbourhoods to harden this down to ensure there's no further risk. So um, I, I, I'm happy with where they're at. I don't feel we have a significant threat in any one area by any means. Uh, but we do need to operationally keep moving resources around and making sure it's safe before we start to safely reestablish and get people back into their community. I can tell you that it is one of the highest priorities for us is to get people back into their homes, sleeping in their own beds as soon as we can. And as soon as we can safely do that, we will do so. Um, I think that's all I'll add today. Uh, again, the, the EOC staff are in there uh, assisting it with us and working uh, uh, hand in hand with uh, the incident management team from BC Wildfire to get full assessments and information out as quickly as we can. Thank you. Morning, everybody. Uh, it's uh, my, definitely my privilege to be here. I just wanted to start off kind of echoing some of the comments here. Um, just let the public know whether you're local uh, across the province or across Canada or, you know, friends across the world is the support really makes a difference. It uh, really bolsters people's spirits. I know the, the firefighters who are working on the line get to see the actual, the, they get to see the progress that they're putting in and, and that's a motivator in themselves. But um, you know, for all the first responders, the firefighters, the police officers, um, folks working in the EOC, and then, you know, um, city staff keeping the water going for us and stuff like that. They really, really appreciate it. So um, it certainly doesn't go unnoticed. Um, just want to provide a little bit of a brief update on the fire in Lake Country from, you know, yesterday afternoon and, and overnight. So we are starting to get back to regular business in Lake Country. So we have uh, crews in the station. Uh, servicing the community and sort of putting the pieces back together. Um, fire departments yesterday and, and overnight worked specifically around the homes, just uh, working sort of in a uh, 50 to 100 foot uh, zone, just doing that cold trailing and making sure that all any spot fires and things like that are put out. And it's very systematic and it's very efficient. And I'm super impressed with the work they did. They did. They got done overnight and, and yesterday. Uh, the stru structure protection crews uh, continue to install sprinklers, put wet lines in behind properties, and helps protect the, 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 the values at risk there, whether they're homes or critical infrastructure. And um, just it, it works in perfect um, coordination with, with the um, with the fire department apparatus and the wildfire crews. Um, wildfire crews in Lake Country are doing an amazing job. Um, they have, they're um, within a day or two here, they'll have a guard completely around the fire with hose lays in place. Um, some folks might see uh, pockets of flame, but that's just part of the normal work in there that they're doing where they're, they're just eliminating uh, pockets of fuel that, um, that need to be uh, managed that way. It's the safest, most efficient way to do it. Um, we are um, starting the business of, uh, we started it yesterday, sorry, um, of reporting in on, on damaged and, and lost uh, structures. So that work will continue today. And we're also gonna be looking, I know uh, City Kelowna lifted some orders to alerts yesterday and we'll be looking at a, a couple of parcels there. So more to come on that. We just make, have to make sure that um, we're in complete agreement with wildfire and it's the safe thing to do. Um, and, uh, you know, Obviously, out of respect to the scale of the 
the incident on the west side of the lake. If this is my last chance, I just wanted to uh, uh, put out to the, the first responders, the firefighters, the police have been amazing. Like really, really good customer service at the checkpoints, dealing with people that are stressed beyond belief. Um, wildfire, like right from the get-go, our partners at the zone have been just unreal. Um, same with the fire center. You know, we have like long established relationships and just really appreciate all our regional partners. I made a big miss. Um, I mentioned, I called out uh, Peachland for helping us save a bunch of homes and I completely forgot and I, for, I just forgive me, I was pretty short on sleep, but Ellison was right there shoulder to shoulder with us. And um, you know, there was an engine crew from Ellison that saved a complete condominium complex on their own. And uh, I think they deserve huge credit for that. And then as the reinforcements started coming in, Vernon, Penticton, Osoyoos, it was just awesome to have them. Now there's too many to, to name. Um, I uh, just like super grateful. Um, the fire service has paid a huge price this summer, and uh, sorry, man, I was going to try and do this though. This happening again. <laughs> so, just you know what? Um, everybody's behind you. Just finish strong and just really, really finish safe. And uh, yeah, I'll wrap it up there before my mom makes fun of me again. So she didn't. She didn't so sorry. Anyways, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, if we can now go to uh, Chief of uh, the Northwest Side Fire Rescue, Ross Kotorowski. He's joining us online. Ross, please go ahead. Thank you. In the north, we had another calm 24 hours with very little wind, and fire crews were able to make really, really great progress last night. Uh, putting out hot spots, cold trailing, and really keeping fire away from homes in all of the little neighborhoods along West Side Road. Um, just to give everybody an idea about the support that we have on West Side Road. As of this morning, we have five task forces that include 83 structural firefighters and 22 pieces of heavy apparatus, including sprinkler crews and BC wild firefighters with eight pieces of heavy equipment. But I also wanna talk a little bit about the Wilson's Landing Fire Department as they are the most heavily impacted. So there isn't one firefighter from Wilson's Landing that doesn't show up every single day. And we are several days into this event. Several of these firefighters, as they are working in their neighborhoods, have now confirmed that they no longer have a home. And these firefighters want to help their neighbors. They come from their hotel in Kelowna with nothing but a suitcase because that's all that they have left at this time, and they still show up every single day, and they made the promise to me that they're gonna continue to do so. It's probably one of the most inspirational things that I've seen in my firefighting career. Talking a little bit about the future now, uh, with Conway's continuing, we will make really good progress into the foreseeable future. I'll talk a little bit about structural loss. Uh, we don't have Canada Task Force One this far yet. Um, so this is gonna be very vague. Um, so I know it's gonna cause some anxiety with some people and um, hopefully give some people some relief. So structural loss has been seen all the way up to Lake Okanagan Resort with the most heavily impacted in Traders Cove and Lake Okanagan Resort. I can confirm that in the last 24 hours, there has been no structural loss. All properties north of Lake Okanagan Resort have also not seen any damage or structural loss. Uh, they already talked about it a little bit earlier, um, just to let everybody know. The EOC, working alongside with, with us in the field, we're doing absolutely everything we can to do these assessments quickly, make it safe. Uh, we still got a lot of dangers out in this area. Slope stability, danger trees, water systems, all this stuff is gonna need to be assessed. So I ask that everybody remain as patient as you possibly can. And I know you're probably getting tired of hearing me say that, but uh, we, we promise you that we're doing everything we can to get you the status that you need and get you back into your homes. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Uh, next person up will please be 
Jason Bedell, our Emergency Support Services Supervisor. Thank you all. I have to start off today by, by really recognizing the lengthy waits that our evacuees are experiencing in accessing supports. I will say that our resources were stretched thin initially. I, won't, I can't deny that. Um, but I'm here today to give you some updates and I really think we're about to turn that around and start seeing the opposite happening. I have volunteers who are on evacuation order. I have volunteers who don't know if they still have their homes yet they are still showing up every single day to support their community. We truly are all in this together, and the ESS volunteers, they deserve our admiration and our support at this time. I'm gonna give you some updates, but first I want to encourage evacuees who, who, who are having trouble accessing the reception center to please call the provincial ESS line, 1800 585 9559. We thank the province for getting this set up promptly. Please call that if you can't, if you are accessing, if you are having troubles accessing the reception centre. I'm extremely grateful for the public offers we have received to aid our volunteers from the community. I can say that we have received additional staffing from the province to aid us in managing convergent volunteers. We have commenced training, which started yesterday, on the training these volunteers, and we are working diligently to operationalise them. We are working to get back to those who have, who have reached out to us initially. Further information will be forthcoming soon. I have to give a shout out to my colleagues in Penticton and Vernon who have taken all the stops out to give us support. Samaritan's Purse has arrived late last night from Calgary to commence the setup and management of a new group lodging facility. And I am working diligently to operationalize a second reception center in that location. Please ensure you are connected with emergency, called emergency.ca to get the latest updates in relation to those. The Insurance Bureau of Canada is available to those evacuees who are unsure what their insurance policy will cover. Please connect with them on their call center line at 1-844-227-5422 or via askibcwest at ibc.ca. Disaster psychosocial supports are providing psychological first aid to evacuees, staff and volunteers. These amazing volunteers are available at Prospera Place and Royal LePage Arena, and we are looking to expand them where possible into our new locations as they come online. We have been able to create an online portal to inform evacuees of where you are in that queue. So when you go to Royal LePage Arena, you are receiving coloured chit system, so you know when to come back. This will be online and more information will be available on courtemergency.ca. We are still prioritising accommodation for those who do not have it. We are very grateful for those visitors who have voluntarily left their hotel rooms, and this has greatly increased our capacity for evacuees. And we are working extremely hard to get people into those rooms as soon as possible. Lastly, I want to reassure, reassure the evacuees that we are pulling out all the stops to support you. We are extremely appreciative of the province who have been working hand in hand with us to remove the roadblocks that we are coming across. We need to get these supports to our evacuees and we are doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, that wraps up our speakers for today. We're going to move into taking questions now. Just as a reminder, it will be one question and one follow-up question from each outlet. And I also just wanted to point out one more time the thanks to having uh, Mayor Gord Milson, Chief Robert Louie, Mayor Tom Diaz, Mayor Blair Ireland and our CMP Superintendent Kara Triance also here if there are questions for those people. And folks, I'm sorry, we're going to do a little musical chairs again today, so depending on who people have questions for. So we'll start now with a question at the podium. Uh, Richard Zussman, Global News, uh, Chief Brolin, this is for you. I'm trying to get an understanding on the structure loss. So 50 structures confirmed, and you mentioned some of the harder hit areas, the assessment had not been done yet. Can you give us a sense of how big an area you're looking there and what additional um, tough news may people uh, find out and how quickly? The numbers 
uh, not going to be less than 50 now. That's what we know about. Um, but as I said, the team from Canada Task Force One is now pushing into the most damaged uh, neighbourhoods. Um, we've done the easy ones, um, but we're moving into the areas where the fire burned hottest. Uh, I described it as a hurricane. Trees pushed over by their roots. This is the kind of neighbourhood that we're in today. So undoubtedly the, that number will grow higher. Um, but it's difficult to tell because some of these areas are also the more rural and remote areas of the community. So the properties are further apart and the terrain is more difficult. Some of these larger properties have more than one home uh, on each property. So we're having to actually be boots on the ground searching through the properties uh, to, to get the counts. Can we go to a question online, please? Thanks, Jody. Rob Monroe, you can unmute your microphone and ask your question. Um, thank you. It's Rob Monroe from InfoNews.ca. Uh, I'm just trying to get some idea of the range of these fires. Um, we know that uh, now that it hasn't gone further north than Okanagan Lake Resort, uh, and it has a bird Smith Creek, um, but there was mention of it going into the wildlands, so how far to the west this is traveling and um, is there any outline that we can give of the uh, two fires on the east side of the lake and how what areas they're covering how close they are they are to neighborhoods i think that's a question for jared yeah <clears throat> thanks for the question rob um to outline as we move forward and by saying i guess i'll preface that by saying that um when i say moving forward out of the interface environment that's not to take away from that priority that resides within the interface and we will begin moving out of it when we've completed the, the very critical work uh, within that space um, looking forward as these fires um, as we begin to resource and action the areas outside of that interface um, we'll, we'll have a much better idea of the scope and, and scale of the movement and the impacts out there in the more wildland and forested environment. Um, to date, as, as of this morning and reports from uh, the overnight period, we have not seen much further growth north, um, not in any uh, a meaningful manner that would be more than a couple hundred meters, uh, less than a kilometer, so to speak, and same with the western edge of the fire. But there is still active fire there, and it is something that we are closely monitored, monitoring, um, but unfortunately is limited from uh, the visibility that we're able to um, utilized through our aviation assets to get that broader overhead view. So a lot of the knowledge in these spaces that we're getting is coming from our boots on the ground, um, individuals that are traversing these, these portions of, uh, in particular, the McDougal fire here uh, to the north and to the west. Rob Monroe, did you have a follow-up question? Uh, yes, some, along those lines, um, it doesn't sound like it's getting too far to the west, but do we know how far it may be from the uh, BC Hydro uh, power line that provides power to that side of the lake? It's a long way, it, not a long ways, but it's a ways away from that yet, Rob. So there's no, no concern that it will check or threaten that area? Not an immediate concern, no. Thank you, Robin Rowe. We'll take the next question at the podium, please. Oh, hi. Uh, my name is Alyssa Tebow with CTV. Uh, this question is for the RCMP, and it's from my colleague who's up in the Shushwap area at the moment. I'm hoping you can speak to this. Um, but she was asking about uh, the added burden on RCMP officers with people stealing firefighting equipment from that area. I'm not going to be able to answer any uh, property crime related questions about the shoe shop, but I can point you to Corporal James Grandy at Southeast District who will be able to answer that. Okay. Um, and nothing about whether charges would possibly be laid? No, nope. sorry. My area of uh, scope and control is Peachland, West Kelowna, Kelowna, and uh, the surrounding regional district area here. Uh, but I can certainly refer you to my colleagues in the Salmon Arm area. Okay, I will ask you, uh, because yesterday the RCMP said that there were some suspicious individuals at some of the checkpoints. Do you have an update on, and, and maybe even for people who are out of their homes, that their Absolutely. properties are safe? Absolutely. So, uh, Superintendent Caratrians, for the Kelowna Regional uh, RCMP Detachment, and I can speak about the area in the central Okanagan. As of this morning, we have behind evacuated orders 
at evacuated ordered areas, no confirmed break and enters uh, in Lake Country, West Kelowna and Kelowna. What I can tell you is uh, there's been a lot of discussion on social media uh, with respects to property crime and or people accessing those areas. And so we have had individuals who have been located behind evacuated ordered areas. And in all cases, those individuals have been escorted out. Many people have uh, tried to come in through uh, forested areas or accessed areas to um, come back home to pick up things. And we just want to remind the public that that is not a safe thing to do. We've heard from our fire chiefs today, there are active flames in these areas. Uh, I had an opportunity to go into two specific areas yesterday for uh, an assessment of, of one area. And we have uh, hydro lines that are down, that are, are hanging in areas across roads. We have uh, a gas, a uh, Fortis gas employee who came uh, running down the road at me and said, this house is dumping gas. So. We have those orders in place for your safety and security, and we are asking that you stay out of those areas. Where there were uh, three reports of property crime in the, uh, or insecure premises in the West Kelowna area, we have made contact with all three homeowners, and uh, in all of those cases, uh, one was um, a broken window and uh, insecure premise from active firefighting, uh, completed by the firefighters in the performance of their, their work. And uh, two other uh, property crime uh, reports that came in were insecure premises, uh, and those were checked by the police officers and connected with the homeowners. And both of those were confirmed to be not break and enters. What I really want to ask the public to do is we are seeing uh, through uh, individual communities posts on social media, we cannot actively monitor all of your social media groups. And we need you to call 911 if you see unauthorized area on your home cameras in your neighborhoods. Please call 911 to report suspicious activity so we can actively respond. We have uh, people at checkpoints and rovers in every community uh, roving your communities to make sure your neighborhoods are safe. And we can have somebody there very quickly. You are, are helping us by reporting that crime. Uh, we can send a police officer over. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention was just that uh, as you are um, viewing people and individuals within your area, please note that uh, there are a lot of active employees in those areas trying to make those neighborhoods safe so we can quickly return back, including uh, the Canada Task Force One uh, staff, um, infrastructure staff, technical support staff, and uh, tree fallers, firefighters. So a lot of calls are happening of what is this vehicle on my street? Uh, what is this... Um, um, person doing in my yard, those are useful calls to us as well. We can usually verify uh, very quickly who that is because we have emergency operations center staff and police officers embedded in the emergency operations center to confirm who that person is in that area performing what work. We have a lot of unmarked police cars and unmarked vehicles uh, being used in this case uh, behind evacuated order lines and keeping our marked vehicles out in the front so the public can see those uh, more clearly. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. Uh, next question at the podium, please. Rob from Castanet. Hi, Rob Gibson with Castanet. I'm not sure which one of you fellows wants to take this. Uh, Jason, you talked about the work that Canada Task Force One did. Maybe you could give us a better sense of specifically what they're doing, maybe versus the, the military and what your crews are doing. Thanks, Rob. Um, obviously, with uh, probably today over 500 on the org chart, I'd imagine there's a lot of different jobs being done out there, specialized work across the board uh, by BC Wildfire fighting the fire in the urban interface as well as in the, the wildland um, behind the community. Um, and our structural firefighters, not only from West Kelowna Fire Rescue, but from structural departments around the province fighting um, around the houses. Uh, the work that we've tasked uh, Canada Task Force One with, the heavy urban search and rescue team, is not necessarily related to firefighting, although there are firefighters on the team. Uh, the work that we've tasked them with is being on the ground, traversing all of the streets that we've ordered out, um, and verifying immediately and quickly the losses that have taken place in those neighbourhoods. They're also working diligently to conduct searches um, of properties that uh, are identified as requiring to be searched. And they have a number of additional resources that they can bring to bear in those situations. 
Of course, where they're finding active fire, they're calling it in and the firefighters are suppressing that. Where they're finding active utilities, and we've talked about that a lot in the last little bit, water spraying out of the water service, gas spraying out of the gas. All right, so we've been bringing you an extended news conference from Kelowna in British Columbia because it is the scene of a major evacuation in our country. Tens of thousands of people have been forced out of their homes.